Greetings, true believers, and welcome to episode 55 of the Polis Podcast, a bi-weekly show about comics, pop culture, and faith. My name is Chris Poirier, and with me, as always, is the one, the only, Hector. How's it going, Hector? This is actually a variant of Hector, and oh. uh, but, you know, you can call but, me but, Eli. Wait, what, what Nexus event led to you? Black Widow releasing on Disney+. Plus. That seems fair. Oh, wow. There's just so much to cover. It's been like it's been forever. So many variants. So many Nexus events. So many alligator versions of oneself? Well, if you were looking for a spoiler-filled episode, I guess you're here. So strap yourselves in and prepare yourselves for We've Got Comic Sign. Uh, better put the word out. Can't wait for the nerd. Uh, on today's episode of The Pull List, we've got a wonderful show for you. We're going to hit the latest news that you need to know. Our must-pull recommendations from, well, um, the last two weeks slash two months. We, we've been on break. We have some ground to cover. Our favorite new number ones and so much more. That's right, baby. We're back. This is The Pull List Podcast. So I, I guess that means we have to catch up on, like, all of um the news that's occurred well no i can't do that i'm going to i'm going to try to keep it to the most recent stuff because 2 months is 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 a long time in the comic book industry in fact basically the entire opening of the show covered literally an entire thing that was breathed into existence and then out of existence and then we're going to get a season 2 an entire mcu movie dropped i mean next week we get new dceu stuff so it's just a lot, isn't it, Hector? It is a lot, and I'm actually really looking forward to Suicide Squad. So Right? And I, a sentence that not many people thought that they would utter. I've been saying that since James one. Gunn was attached to the project, though. Like, I mean, that's fair. I've been and a the, James Gunn person forever, so that's like that's not new for me, but I feel you. It's going to be good stuff. So uh, I think what I'm going to do then is I'm going to break up our news segment into a little – we have two different parts. Uh, this time around and we kind of have some of the comic books that are coming up in the next couple months that I think are at least somewhat interesting or people want to know more about and then some industry stuff because well there's always something going on and before we went on break there was a lot going on with DC um, Diamond Marvel and their independent folks with Penguin um, and publishers and just all kinds of weird stuff going on in the industry, right? So I want to kind of catch up on those two things. But the first thing is let's talk about some of the new books that are coming in the next couple months that might be at least of um, some interest to folks, I might say. Uh, maybe not. Who knows? But like I normally do, Hector, I, I have a question for you. Do you feel like you need more Joker in your life right now? Depends on who's writing it. Uh, Matthew Rosenberg. Yep. Don't know who that is. Yep, good. So, moving right along. Just in case you didn't notice, there's still a lot of Bat Family books on the shelves. There are quasi-simultaneous minis or events going on, because in case you forgot, Checkmate is still a thing, and Leviathan is still out there somewhere. Do, do you care? Anybody? No? I picked up Checkmate just because, question, and I wanted to peek at it, but I haven't read it yet. That's fair. Um, but also... We have the Joker um, going on, and we had heart. We had black label adjacent Joker stuff. Well, just in case you needed more, how about another limited series starting? It should be starting next week, about about the time that this episode comes out. Congratulations! You can run to your store after you hear this, and you're going to get a story called Joker and uh, the Puzzle Box. Okay. Not enough? Okay, I'll give you more. Uh, so, the jo this sounds like a pretty standard, quote-unquote, Joker story that literally GCPD is going to cover a body um, with a box. And that's what you got to go on. Joker's going to run hard in the paint with gimmicks and all that good stuff. And it sounds like it's going to be semi-police procedural because there seems to be heavy influence on GCPD and all that good stuff. But... I don't know. I feel slightly jokered out at the moment. What's jokering you out? What was that? What like what are you reading or doing that's jokering you out though? I just feel like he's the main point of almost everything right now. Like he's not even the main point of his book. 
right, but at the same time, it's he's the primary villain that's at least distracting from it. Um, Bat and Cat, uh, he has a central point, even though he's not the main character. Um, the he's being at least blamed in mainline continuity for the Arkham attacks at the beginning of everything. So there's this thread that it's all Joker lately to me. And maybe I'm overreading into it, but I was about to say, um, like, you know, I, I think I read about as many comic books as you did <laughs> in the past <laughs> two days. And uh, like Joker's not as heavy as it feels like. And Bat and Cat was like a month ago. Yeah. Well, that's two months of making stuff up. But he died at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, oh, no. Spoilers. Not oh, spoilers. Dude, that was like you a knew year that, ago. At you this knew point. that was coming. I feel like it's more on the level that there's too much Jason Todd, not too much Joker, but you know. Oh, good. It. Well, then, then I'll pivot. So, d- do you want more Jason Todd? Depends on who's writing it. <laughs> <laughs> if you're sensing a trend here, everyone, um, it does have. Sometimes the creative teams make a huge difference in things, and they should. But um, how do you feel about Jason Todd and zombies? I just did a whole book of that called uh, un- Deceased Unkillables. Yeah. How would you feel if it was that but not that and they call it Task Force Z and they give him a new costume and he basically is huntering jokerized um, zombies? I'm not... It sounds better than the future state Gotham stuff we've got to go on. That's fair. So basically, supposedly where this falls in the timeline of everything is after the Arkham Asylum attack. Um, This falls straight after that. And the Joker's laughing gas has created a bunch of zombie like characters. And Jason Todd's going to go, you know, full Jason on them, basically. Arkham Asylum uh, attack now known in perpetuity as A-Day. Congratulations. If you wanted it, didn't want it, it's got a name. It's a day. Yeah, that's basically all we've got at the moment. Um, but that book is coming uh, just in time for Halloween. Of course it is. Of course it is, right. Um, but it's technically in mainline continuity, so congratulations, I suppose. I'm I'm still waiting for an apology letter for that other Jason Todd book they tried to start, like, four months ago <laughs> i think we ended our previous season on that topic and now we're starting on it so I i'm gonna stick with Big it on that one i spent two i spent like nine dollars on a storyline <laughs> that's never getting resolved and i'm not okay uh, with that like, yeah the they, joy the joy of comics they started a story killed it said nothing and here we are i mean isn't that ultimately the story of jason todd Oh no! <laughs> too too soon. <laughs> that's that's low, bro. <laughs> that's that's offensive. Ooh! Uh, uh, thanks for the setup have on to that leave one. This podcast now. It's been real. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oof. Okay. Well, maybe maybe the last new comic will give you um, something to look forward to. I'm at least curious because it's a character that Marvel doesn't seem to bring to bear a ton, at least in print. Um, but starting in October as well, uh, we're finally going to get kind of, it's another mini, unfortunately, this is the only thing I don't like about it is whenever Marvel decides to take Luke Cage out of the box and actually write a story, it always seems to be a mini lately, not even an attempt at an ongoing, but we're going to get a three part mini, um, in October that is I'm trying to figure out where they're dropping this in the storyline because Marvel has like a ton of different things going on as well. No, it pretty much is kind of an isolated story. Um, Fisk is still mayor. So it's adjacent to that part of the storyline and daredevil and, and Spider-Man and everything that's going on in the primary, but it does look like it's going to be an isolated kind of story event. Um, So I'm always down for reading more, Luke Cage. I just wish they'd let Luke hang around longer than one to six episodes slash comics. Well, it's like his uh, Jessica Jones's book that I enjoyed a lot like a year or two ago. Mm. You know, that was cool, but, you know, just kind of faded into nothingness. And 
they act like both of these characters didn't carry two to three seasons of television themselves. You can keep a book going, guys. Right. Really and can. literally two to three seasons that then when they found out that they were being canceled and be, part of that being the contracts moving around and everything, but people being like, wait, wait, what? G- give me back the thing. We, we just started liking the thing. Why are you taking it from us? So, yeah, you know, get back on that. But I'm at least excited. Maybe this is part of this new methodology that we're seeing in a lot of the publishers of doing minis that if they do well are like, oh, look, suddenly there is a full series at the end of the book. And I don't know if I'm in love with this new try before you pull the trigger creatively on a longer creative arc. But if it gets me more stories I actually want, then fine. Maybe I will buy in. But this is kind of rumored to be kind of DC's platform going forward as well is that they kind of chop up the continuity and the smaller bits so that folks can be like, yeah, that's cool. And then if the book sales go through, they're like, oh, look, here's more. I don't know. I think it makes for difficult editorial planning, but maybe not. Maybe this is exactly the change that all this stuff needed. But, oh, speaking of DC, I don't even have the notes on this, but I I noticed it while I was reading. Did, did you catch the next state, state air quotes right now, you can't see that because it's a podcast, but it's air quotes, the next state that DC is about to enter? No. Oh, you did you read Batman 110? Yeah. Yeah, um, there's a really lame piece of dialogue in it and all the advertisements for that other adjacent book about Oracle's new project. Did you catch that? No. Nope. There's advertisement in like every DC book. It's about a paranormal project that Oracle is over. Okay. It's a one page ad in almost like everything from the last month. And I'm betting it drops in October, so I will dig it up for the next episode. But um, it's very clear that the next thing quote unquote is fear state. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well yeah. that's what the joke that's what um <laughs> Scarecrow's been working towards forever. Yes. But it's gonna be arc. an it's it's clear that it's gonna be an actual thing. Like I, I guarantee a a comic reading list is forthcoming. Cause as I just looked at it all I'm like, oh no, just stop. <laughs> Stick with Infinite Frontier. Give me something. <laughs> It's and then we'll it'll all collapse together with crisis state, <laughs> right? And then we'll have what the fifteenth crisis, and then we'll just move on to whatever's next. Yes, comics Sounds can fair. be a joy. I think this is like the sixth crisis. If the ex- whenever the next one comes, right? I'd have to go back and actually timeline that because we've been through a lot of crises. Crisis well, I just in just in my tenure of reading comics, we've had uh, Infinite Crisis, Final Crisis. What was the recent one? Well, it well, did they call it a crisis? I'm blanking now. That's well, terrible. I had Identity Crisis, Infinite Crisis, Final Crisis. That's right. But there was one I thought after that was considered a crisis too, but you know, whatever. Yeah, lots of stuff happened. Keep up. So there's a handful of new projects coming. There's even more than that. For those of you that are X-Men fans, like there's tons of new X stuff coming again. Um, as we continue to play out kind of what happened during Hickman's run and just all the different pieces. So keep your eyes out. There's tons of new stuff out there. We're going to talk about it a little later. So save it for the podcast that, you know, Moon Knight's back. There's, there's all kinds of stuff from places that are occurring. The summer just got kind of wild as a full back to full blown comics, as well as just summer into the fall is usually when we start seeing new projects And all that stuff. And then we run into Halloween, then we run into Christmas, and then we start everything all over again. So the comic pace just never seems to slow down. And as part of that is a lot of the industry side. So I warned you that we would talk a little bit about this. And there are a few things that kind of popped up I found interesting. And one of them popped up literally in the last couple hours while I was preparing to sit down. And that's the conversation that a handful of us have had on and off for three or four years now. Um, Because it was three, four years ago that DC did the, we're going to partner with Walmart to do these one 
these giant size comics. Don't worry, local brick and mortar comic book stores. It's not that we're trying to get away from you. It's we're trying to get you new customers by putting comics back in the toy section um, of a big box store and being exclusive to them before we are to you. But somehow that benefits you. And they were never in the toy section, though. Yeah, but they were supposed to be. And that's what was funny. Is the, and now there's a whole nother comic company that has their comics in Walmart. Mm-hmm. So apparently a lot of concerns from a lot of independent retailers were not unfounded because DC basically just recently doubled down on the, no, we really do think there's something to this, this whole Walmart thing. And we really do think the next generation of comic book readers are going to come from our big box stores and not from our local um, comic shops. Um, and oof. Um, as a former retailer, that kind of pings my heart a bit. Like, I, I do like the idea of more readers falling in love with comics that then make them go to seek out a comic book store and the experience that comes with that. But um, this is the, the article that I attached in the notes for everyone to read is basically they did a Space Jam um, release side by side with the release of the movie. And yeah. apparently it's it's done really well. Um, the, it also cites the other thing is like, you know, um, the dog man, um, graphic novel novels for kids. It's the same dude that does captain underpants and all that. Yeah. Dave Pilkney. Mm -hmm. Um, well, the last graphic novel of dog man has sold almost a million copies in four months. (laughs) And the reason Hector's laughing is because that is a dumb amount of any comic skew. The fact that it's close to a million is like a big deal, especially as an explicitly all ages aimed at a younger audience type thing. Now, granted, those skews are available in lots of different places. And that's always going to be part of this discussion is the, yeah, if you put some product that moves off a shelf into a big box store, guess what? You're going to sell it. Um, But... I think it's going to place a lot of publishers into the where is my market actually conversation. And with COVID um, and a a lot of stores closed over the last year, um, unfortunately, that I think they're eyeing the big box stores as an easier distribution for them. Should also read low cost distribution uh, for them. And it's just always kind of been a concern of a lot of folks of if DC decides that the market isn't local comic shops, that if we're just going all in to try to get that next generation, then we're going to change the model entirely. Doesn't seem to be a fever dream anymore that a lot of us kind of figured based on a lot of changes that occurred that this was reality. But it makes me nervous. It makes me sad for some local comic shops. I get that. And, but the reality is, I think those will be good for new readers. Yes. But outside of intentionally going for a couple months to get those books, like, I haven't even been in Walmart to get those things. When I did go, they were nearly impossible to find after a little while. And getting, you're paying $5 for a book. Granted, yeah, it's a thick book. But beyond that, like you are only paying for a maybe four pages of a new story. Right. And for a lot of the hardcore folks or the season collector or the longer term collector, we look at that and go, yeah, that's silly. But like you said, to a new person, they're still going to see that's 100 pages for five dollars where part of the standard buy now for a regular 32 page comic for a lot of DC stuff is that same price. I I just, I think it, I'm not as the ship is sinking with this as I could be, because I honestly feel like it's not going to take a big dent out of comic shops. Um, Just because I think the relationship base and everything else is still going to be the biggest factor in what keeps those shops going. Yes. Because I know for me, because like, if you've listened to this, I like for a long time, I was digital just because of space and flooding and hurricanes and stuff like that. All valid. 
all valid. Um, and now I'm at the point where I'm at like two years of consistent in-person buying or getting close to it. And like, I support shops because of the people. Mm -hmm. Um, because if people aren't the reason I'm going there, I'm just going to buy them on my phone. (laughs) Yeah. No, I, I happen to entirely agree with you. I think the concern that some retailers have is if corporate folks eventually go, yes, but X, Y, Z dollars equals more over in this other category, then there's no reason to continue to cater to a local comic shop model, even though that's the benefit. And there's some folks who are concerned in the long run that just the product lines are going to change as a result of that. And I don't think that's the sky is falling, but I think it's a valid concern because the customers are very different. Yeah, fair. Um, but we'll see. With some of this independence on the publishing and distribution side, some of that margin is now finally going back to the publisher, which was always a concern. And that's kind of our last piece for this week with Diamond um, distribution and everything going on that – One of the things that really messed up a lot of local comic shops over the last couple months is with Marvel finally setting their deal with Random House, um, but allowing Diamond to still carry their stuff, the questions became, well, are our discount tiers going to remain in place? Now, discount tiers are based on the volume of stuff you get. Well, (laughs) when... The most of your volume is going to be Marvel and DC, and Marvel and DC are no longer exclusive with you. Your volume just went way down. Um, so a lot of folks, you know, got basically updates earlier this year that said, "Yeah, your discount here just went to trash because a majority of what comic shops buy is Marvel and DC." So. After some pushback and everything, Diamond's decided to freeze everybody's tiers until the end of the year, but it still sounds like at some point, potentially doing business with Diamond, even though they carry everything other than Marvel and DC, is going to become more expensive um, by next year. And it's because that volume of purchasing is just never going to be the same on third-party product. Um. So it's it's interesting, but it's also kind of scary, I think, for some places. And I've got a fairly small shop locally, and they're saying they're like, you know, I, I don't buy books in that. And even new comic um, free comic book day books this year had preset buckets of numbers they had to hit to just buy it. And I was like, well, that's new. Um And I think this is showing what's kind of coming is with all the distribution now suddenly getting kind of moved around, which ultimately I do think is a good thing for the publishers and everything. But with Diamond's enterprise kind of collapsing on itself now, the repercussion is actually impacting the smaller stores the most Um, because their product simply costs more now just by bigger corporations changing their contracts and putting ink on paper. So I do think some changes are coming to what some smaller local shops look like or what product that they're even getting in. So it's just something to kind of be aware of. If you hit your shop and you have a frustrated owner, you, you can say that you kind of get it, that things kind of got bounced around this year on them and everyone's waiting to see what they all kind of fall out on as things go forward. So Interesting stuff, stuff that we will keep an eye on. Um, but that's what you need to know. That's our bi-weekly look at the industry and delivering you all of the inside knowledge. As always, you can join in on the conversation with Hector and I and all of our nerdy friends over on the Love Thy Nerd uh, Discord and also in our Facebook community. So you can just jump on in there, have that wonderful weekly geeky adventure together with us. Tell us what you liked, what you hated, or possibly even what we missed. We probably missed a lot in the last two months, so hit us up. I mean, we even have our very own comics channel over on that Discord, so hit us up. You can find the links in the show notes and ask your questions. 
What's up, nerd? You digging this podcast? Well, the audio enjoyment doesn't end there. Visit LTNOnAir.com and make LTN Radio your new go-to for the best Christian rock, rap, pop, and indie, as well as our exclusive LTN shows and podcasts, some of which air on the station before they're available anywhere else. Visit LTNOnAir.com to listen now and find the link to our app. Now back to the show. Now, on to the main event, and we got to talk about those polls, so let's see if we can find something to put in your long box for this week. Hector, what is what made your long box after some polls over the last couple months? Uh, I didn't put it on the list because I haven't read the most recent one, but uh, Nightwing has consistently been great. Uh, the whole thing with the Heartless, I've got mm-hmm. a issue. The most recent issue is actually sitting in a pull box at a comic book shop right now, and I've been on the road, so I haven't read it, but Nightwing's been great. Um, just throwing that out there. But on my actual ones for talking about today, uh, first off, Better A Bill. I think actually one of the last episodes we did, it was just starting. Um, but yeah, it actually, about right. Yeah, it just concluded today or yesterday, like this this past week. Um the story just concluded. It was a five issue arc. And I got to say, it was a delightful book. Um, I could have honestly used about three more issues for some resolution. Um, but it's exactly, um, it grew into being what I really wanted it to be, which is if you've ever seen, um, the episode of doctor who called the doctor's wife, where Mm. the doctor's time machine, the TARDIS becomes a sentient human female. This same thing happens with Better A Bill, but the whole the whole plot line is, and I, I know I said this before, but I'm saying it again, is that he uh he can't change back into his original form anymore, and he wants to be loved, and so he goes on this insane quest to get a weapon that will allow him to change back to his human form or humanoid form, and you've got a sentient version of the ship that's been with him his entire life trying to say hey you're valuable and loved where you are and that's literally the plot line outside of oh, odin opening a uh craft beer um brewery so there's that too o- um, odin did odin did what <laughs> odin is living in um disguise running a craft beer establishment do we get to know what the beer is called yes it's in there <laughs> um, oh it was a couple issues ago I, I can't remember that one and the book ends with a big climactic battle with surter mm-hmm. so you get all of that um i could have used a little bit more resolution um i really think another issue would have done great things for it but as it stands it was a great book um then uh let's see Noctera is still continuing to be a fantastic ride of comic book adventure. Um, issue five is uh, out and good. And like the storyline just keeps developing. And like, it's one of those things where like normally they give you two issues to pitch an idea. And then it's just like, okay, you can tell where the whole thing is going from there. Right. This on the flip side has been, Every single issue is another layer, and I don't feel like we've even, even hit the middle yet. Um, oh, interesting. And, uh, like, it's like I'm learning something new every issue. It's devel- it's developing well. Um, so we're five issues. I'm five issues in, and I think it's wonderful. Um, and it makes me happy for Scott Snyder, um, returning to some great things for him. And uh, let's see. So Nocturne number five. Also, um, the other history of the DC universe, number four. Um, I think another issue of this book has dropped, but I haven't picked that one up yet. But if you know me, um, you know that one of my favorite characters is Renee Montoya as the question. And, Mm. uh, the other history of the DC universe, number four is a whole spotlight piece on Renee as the question and becoming the question. Um, and it was wonderful. It was a great story about her trying to be the good girl to 
make mom, dad, and Jesus happy. Um, in her exact words. And, and just everybody then. Yeah. Uh, she, she wanted to make God happy. She wanted to make mom and dad happy. And so she was trying to be the best person she could be in Gotham. Um, and you know, it, you know, stuff about her sexuality became an issue. Um, st- it goes through all the stuff of her GCPD days, her stuff with Christmas Allen on to, uh, meeting Kate and 50, you know, how we met her and Kate in 52 and what it's like for her to actually wear the mask that she wears. And, um, this felt like one of the most genuine Renee Montoya pieces since, um, 52 itself. And beyond that, uh, like it still throws me for a loop when I'm reading stuff like this. And then I just see Montoya as a, an actual cop in the bullpen again in the current back books. And I'm like, what are we doing? <laughs> like, why is she in a blouse with like big poofy hair and not, you know, being who, okay, whatever. Cool. Um, it's just like, it throws me off sometimes. Um, but that one was great. I love Renee. I bought both covers of it. Um, and, uh, yeah, there are, there are some things in the book that aren't the most flattering towards the faith community. But let's be honest, the faith community is not always the most flattering towards the faith community. So, um, oh, we can, so truthful. <laughs> we can always do better. And, uh, and I always look at things like this as like little good reminders of that. Um, but it was a fantastic book. And I, I actually want to look and see who the most recent issue was. Um, but, uh, beyond that, let's see. And then the, another one is a uh, homesick pilots. Number six. I've been talking about homesick pilot, homesick pilots since day one. Um, and homesick pilots number six basically kicks off a new story, mm. but it kicks off a new story in the same story. Like, uh, Homesick Pilots issues one through five, a couple punk rock bands go into a haunted house and are half of them are eaten by the haunted house. And one of the main characters becomes the living embodiment of the evil that's in the house, trying to collect pieces of the house or the, its magical properties that are missing. Um, and to the point where it's doing a lot of damage and a lot of destruction and issue five ended with the main character of the first five books, uh, kamikaze the giant haunted house into the ocean to rather than let it do the destruction it wanted to do doing that. Well, now, uh, some remnants of the homesick pilots and the other band that has profanity in its name. So I'll bypass it for the sake of the podcast. Um, <laughs> womp 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 womp. Um, the nuclear illegitimate children. Um, but, (laughs) uh, that's actually a better band name than their real band name. Um, I figured it out. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the remnants of the homesick pilots and the nuclear kids are, um, joining forces with a government agency to basically learn how to control the ghost properties that they found in the previous thing. So that when something like that rises up again, they're creating their own Gundam task force of, ah, oh, geez, the government's ghosters. the worst. Huh? Said so the government's the worst. The government is the worst. So basically the government hired some punk rock kids to build them some ghost Gundams. That's, that's not punk rock at all. <laughs> well, that's, that's actually one of the guys. He's like, this isn't punk rock. This is selling out. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, literally a line it's like literally um, not how that works and so there's issue seven is already out but that is sitting in my pull box as well but issue six um gave me hope that this cool little short story wasn't a one-hit wonder Mm. so those are my goals i do need to pick up the trade then and catch up on that one because i am i am deficient in in some of the indies and that just sounds quite wonderful and i well, keep not, the, not the doing it the whole thing with um punk, with uh with homesick pilots was one of my favorite reads of 2021 easily um yep. and so you know i i would recommend it but i do so yes <laughs> so you do just as i said wonderful 
I have some things. Uh, Ascender has been one of the books that I've been talking a lot about, which was the the sequel to Descender, and it continues to be just a magnificently beautiful book. Um, that's the thing that this entire series has been kind of in this watercolor style that's just really neat. And also they've been doing this thing of they manage the pull at your heartstrings and make you cry in the most awkward and weird places in the story, and you're like, how dare you, comic book, make me cry? And it, they did it again, and I won't spoil it, but they've done a really good job of connecting characters throughout the entire arc of the story from descender to this ascender story where it was all about people and machines in the first half. And now it's people, machines and magic um, in the universe. And you now finally understand come this issue that that's the breakdown of the universe is that it was science slash machines versus humanity. And then, Oh yeah, the magic, the magic fools showed up (laughs) and everyone's like, ah, Magic makes everything hard. (laughs) Um, But the whole story that's been being told now for quite a while is going to end in issue 18. So now's a great time to catch up on a lot of issues, but everything's in trade from Descender and most of Ascender is as well. And you should read it because it is a sci-fi story unlike many others that you've read. I mean, there's some sci-fi tropes in there, but there's a lot of trope breaking in it as well. And it's just beautiful. And But you need to have read Descender first, right? Yeah, yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. Go back in and get all those um, so you can you can plow through it because I, it now all – I was wondering if they were going to get back to how this all really is tied together and 17 started connecting the, the pieces in a really neat, clean way that I was like, oh, I don't hate this. And I understand now it, it's very much a balance of the universe um, between basically humanity – science tech and magic is where this entire thing is going to fall down at the end of the day. And I'm kind of curious how they're going to end it. Um, Cause they kind of got the whole um, there's got to be balance in the force kind of vibe going. So I'm curious if it will actually balance or if we'll end up with that star Wars brokenness of, well, if all the Sith are dead and there are Jedi, there's not actually balance. So how does balance? What? What? <laughs> You get it, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, that that was kind of the thing. Whenever you do a balancing of stuff, for some reason, stuff seems out of balance. So I'm really curious if he's going to go for a true balance or um, we're going to find out one thing is inherently evil and just evil is bad. But we'll see. They're, the The stage is set and all the pieces are there. So I will continue to sing the praises because it's just a really solid sci-fi and independent well done story um which leads me back to one of the big two that i'm just gonna keep saying nice things about strange academy from marvel and (laughs) issue 11 was really weird because one of the frost giants kids type people literally shattered because you know frost and crystalline and stuff that it's weird so they literally were trying to put humpty dumpty back together again for an entire um issue and trying to figure out who shattered the student and you know up till now basically killed him and uh to solve the mystery they call in howard the duck you're welcome marvel because it's what you needed and what you wanted um that if dr strange ran a hogwarts style school that's completely broken well when a crystalline creature version of a student gets shattered i guess your first go-to is a talking duck from the 80s no fine i still it's it's actually still really well done um it's interesting what's being set up i think there is a greater story that's being told and that's been one of the better parts of this book of it's partial like high school hijinks um, in a very broken Marvel kind of way, um, but that there's also a bigger story being told, and I it's all tied to Doctor Strange and probably Mephisto because everything's Mephisto. Um, but I don't hate it. It's well drawn and it's a great break in the middle of other kind of off the wall superhero books right now, which is why I'm going to keep saying that it's wonderful. And then on the total opposite end of the spectrum. Uh, kind of going back a few months. Um, the last Ronin from the Turtle Stories number three came out like back when we went on 
on break and it's still very solid that I don't I don't want to talk about a lot of what's going on because lots of craziness occurs. Um, yeah, it was a very action packed issue as far as stuff actually yeah. happening. Yep. And so some feels tied up in all of that and just very action based. And it's really neat how they continue to tell this story in that Kevin Eastman pages are inserted as flashbacks, um, which is really cool. Uh, I dig that, that he's involved in a lot of it, obviously, but that very specific pieces that are usually in the flashback and telling the history of certain parts of the story are done in his um, pen and ink. And then Ben Bishop is telling the current story um, in art and everything. And I think that's really kind of neat is that we get bits and pieces of the story done that way. And multiple generations of turtle writers and artists are involved that that's just a neat industry thing on top of just a very good turtle story that they're telling. So read it. Um, and then finally, I'm going to say something nice about Firefly. Ooh. Yeah. So um, the By brand the way, new verse. Mm-hmm. I bought issues two and three and maybe four because of you. I just haven't read them yet. The brand new verse, which ends at issue six. Has been pretty fun. I am relating to the new group. You kind of get your nostalgic feels of seeing where some of the other folks ended up. They come in and out of the story kind of naturally without stealing the center frame. And it feels kind of like Firefly. And we've talked before about where Firefly comics do really well or do really poorly is that does it feel like the show? Does it give me the same feels and beats and everything? And I think they've really done a good job with new people and new content this time. Where the mainline story has kind of, it got really lost, (laughs) really, really lost. Um, But I'm going to take this moment to also say now 30 issues in on the mainline, I feel like that story has actually finally gotten back to something that feels more like Firefly. And I don't know why we had to take that really long detour into the Blue Sun stuff and Sheriff Reynolds and... Yeah, Sheriff Reynolds and all that to end up in a place that actually feels like Firefly again. But here we are. So if you're a brown coat, I'd say there's probably some points in there worth picking back up on and all that good stuff. So those were the things that kind of made it into my poll and are definitely staying in the collection. This week in nerd history, a tall, cool glass of Martian water. Nerd history. That's essentially what the Mars Phoenix lander was sent to find when NASA launched it on August 4th, 2007. Phoenix was the sixth successful landing on Mars, but the first spacecraft to land on the Martian Arctic surface. Its mission was to dig for ice and assess if the Martian Arctic ever had conditions that could support life. In July of the next year, NASA announced that Phoenix confirmed the presence of water ice on Mars as predicted in 2002 by the Mars Odyssey orbiter. During the initial heating cycle of a new sample, Tega's mass spectrometer detected water vapor when the sample temperature reached zero degrees Celsius. Water ice simply means that it contains the same elements as the water we have on Earth and is not another form of ice, such as dry ice, the solid form of carbon dioxide. Many wonder why the discovery of water ice even matters. Well, it's about finding the organic materials and the building blocks for life. With this type of information, we can learn more about the history of Mars and how it became a desert wasteland. Phoenix ended up exceeding its intended 90-day mission, studying the planet for a total of five months. In 2010, NASA lost contact with the lander completely, but the data it collected continued to be studied for many years after. I'm Radio Matt. See you next time for more Nerd History. Let's round out the show with what the people come here for, and that's the number ones that we've seen recently that show us some hope and some Is that good what content come here for. I have no idea. It's probably what Todd <laughs> listens to us for. Hi, Todd. It's just Todd. Hi, Todd. It's just Todd and Kyle, maybe. And Kyle, maybe. Yeah, and a bunch of other people. But you know. Shout out to our peeps. So, um, yeah, I'll let you you hit it off and I'll close this out. So I will say wholeheartedly, um, I've said things about James Tinian before in the past. Um, yeah, you have. I have. I've said words. 
and <laughs> um, his Batman stuff wasn't always the best. I'm, I mean, no, no pull punches. Mm-hmm. Some of his early Batman stuff was not great. Some of those punchlines just didn't land. Oh, but a bunch. <laughs> waka waka. Um, <laughs> that's boo. true. I'm going to boo myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, put that in your long box. Um, but the nice house on the lake, I believe that's what it's called, right? Nice that sounds right. Lake. Yeah. Um, the nice house on the lake was um, yep. kind of a masterpiece. Like okay, I had heard. That, I had heard people were kind of surprised. Yeah, it's the nice house on the lake. Book one um, was kind of a masterpiece, um, and just and I'm just going to give you the the vague plot points because it's been out a long time now. Um, but it's a mature book ish, even just in the dialogue, even if it's not really in the visuals. Mm. But it follows a young woman. Uh, who meets a interesting gentleman at a bar named Walter. And okay. the, fir- the first uh, two thirds of the book is about Walter and this young lady's interaction at a bar or wherever they would go and they would hang out and they would talk. And it was always kind of their joking conversation to talk about how the world would end. And so they said, and they would always be like, hey, you want to continue the conversation? And they would go through the best ways for an apocalypse to happen, stuff like that. Hmm. Well, Walter is having like a birthday or a function or something like that. And he wants, he's demanding basically that if you love him, you need to come to his shindig at the nice house on the lake. And he's got everybody listed by their contribution points like there's the artist the engineer the scientist the politician like they have a label Hmm. um and uh basically they get there the house is immaculate it's beautiful it's wonderful uh everybody's like just so shocked by it and then while they're at the house the world ends oh dang like the world ends in the most gnarly apocalyptic fashions you could possibly imagine. And it turns out uh, that Walter had created that nice house on the lake as the only refuge on earth to save the people that he had gotten attached to while the world ended. Oh, dang. And they're never allowed to leave. Oh, well, the world ended, so where would they go? Well, that's the thing. Their first response was to go out and try and find something out. Um, and I'll just say that was prevented. And I'm leaving out big major details, so don't don't okay. be offended if you feel like this is spoilers. It's it's a general description. There's plenty of meat on the bone. Um, but that's the plot point that these, I want to say, seven friends showed up to a nice house on the lake, and then the world ended. And I'm talking like, some of the description of this felt more like what Joe Hill would write if Joe Hill was better at being Joe Hill. <laughs> Ooh. Yee. <laughs> all right. That's on the, point. Noted. This one story was better than all of bas- uh, basket full of hits. Okay. Um, I expected what I got out of this book out of Joe Hill, not out of James Tenyon. So I will a hundred percent be buying more of these. Um, and like, yes, very much so. Nice. All right. Well, that, that's a tough gig to follow, but, um, I read (laughs) Moon Knight. (laughs) And I knew you would. And I've, I've purchased that and it's waiting for me at home. So you're, you're like the world's ending and all this crazy stuff. And I'm like, I'm going to the guy that wears a white suit and a mask and has, um, is a little out of his mind and is seeing a therapist. Um, but it's healthy and it's good that way. So yeah, we get reintroduced to Moon Knight and all of his glory. But I do have to say this, that they retained the all white suit, white mask version on top of like the armored version of him, because I'm just going to say that I really dug the um, white suit, white 
Ty um, version of Spectre as Moon Knight because it's it's kind of classy. And what's funny is that's what he's doing with him now is he's created an agency. Um, he calls it a mission, and I won't give all of it away because he reminds the entire world that he is a high priest of of Khonshu, and you know that's why he's alive and all that good stuff. So he serves the moon god, and so he's really leaning into the I lead the cult of the moon god and all of that on this one, which seems about right for a crazy dude. Um, but he creates the mission, which is literally kind of like a private eye but more so it's a I'll beat the crap out of your problems agency for people in the city. So they come to him and be like, man, I've got vampires. And he's like, great. I will punch them in the face at night. Um, and other people are like, we've got crazy little ghouls like scratching at my door. And he's like, awesome. I will punch them in their face at night. That That's pretty much his thing. Um, so he welcomes people. But when he is accepting new clients, he's wearing the suit and sitting in a big comfy chair and and all that stuff and he's like welcome to my place please tell me the things that you need me to punch in the face um and then when he goes out at night he has like the full armored version of regular um moon knight but the center of the new story other than that is that he's got a new therapist and they're leaning heavily back into the mark's got a lot of baggage um and he's still dealing with it so a i continually dig when there is a self-aware Mark Spector, um, which Lemire really leaned into in his run, and I've loved ever since. They're continuing that, um, that his therapist is an Avenger-sanctioned therapist, so, like, she kind of gets the whole superhero and, cr- like, literal crazy side of things. Um, but they've also introduced us to the fact of maybe Mark Spector isn't the only one operating on behalf of the moon god and Ooh. that's kind of that's where they drop us is you know he refers to himself as the fist um well the semi spoiler part is the other guy's like well gods have two fists and it's like oh no oh oh snap um and so he's got a diff- brothers right so um it had lots of action it has that wit that's the other thing that i appreciate about moon knight is it's not deadpool but it's still pretty tongue in cheek, heavy handed wit. Um, it's just, he's not talking directly to us. <laughs> it's, he's talking to himself, um, but that's great. And so I, I want it. It looks a lot like Finch's moon Knight graphically, which is the other thing I really dig is I feel like they've taken a lot of the best parts of moon Knight, and we might actually have that story to tell. So, if it doesn't go super far off the rails, which sometimes happens with Marvel books after the first one, I I am cautiously optimistic that this is the Moon Knight story I want. So I'm super excited about it because well, f- Moon, Moon Knight punching stuff in the face. Congratulations, sir. Right? I mean, and that's a Marvel book. Congratulations to us all. We did it. Um, I'm going to... Th- Throw this out there because there was some breaking news during our recording. Uh oh, that actually applies to our bubble of the world. <laughs> Scarlett Johansson has now sued Marvel over the streaming release of Black Widow. Yeah. Oops. Because, uh, as she claims, it violates her contract um, that they had, and she tried to get a hold of them before it released and they would not respond to yeah, her. Yeah, I think my understanding the of news. the con... Hmm? I said that they said that she tried... She Based on the article I read, that she tried to get information from them, but they would not respond to her. Yeah. Part of my understanding, and I think it's what you were alluding to, is that her contract and a lot of others' contracts are based on ticket sales, and if there aren't ticket sales, then does she get that money? Yeah, it said that she lost she w- lost fifty million dollars. Yeah, and I'm assuming that equals equals exactly how many people p- bought Premiere Access. Yeah, because it's not a ticket sale. Ugh, comics, man, it's a cutthroat world out there. <laughs> but we'll keep an eye we'll keep an eye on it, and we'll let you guys know what's going on uh, by the next episode. But. There's always a little something going on out there, but woo, 
That was a lot to pack into a first episode back, but we are on this train, so that's it for us here at the Polis Podcast. Episode 55 is in the books and now in your ears, and Hector and I just honestly want to thank each and every one of you for choosing us as your primary comic book knowledge factory on a pretty well near weekly basis. So don't leave us hanging. Rate and review the show on your podcasting app of choice. We're on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, so many more. We're all over the place, but we're just so glad to be back, be talking comics, and we hope to bring all kinds of new stuff over the next couple months. So thanks for listening. And remember, kids, read read more more comics. comics.